In this video, I want to plow the field uh, for some theology found in the prison uh, letters of Paul, prison epistles, which are, of course, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So let's get started. So what about God in the prison epistles? Uh, a good place to start, I think, is Ephesians 4.6, uh, in which uh, we are told that God, there is one God and Father of us all who is over all, through all, and in all. So this is talking about God the Father, and there is only one God, the Father. Uh, so that would indicate that Ephesians is monotheistic, which I know surprises everybody, um, that um, Ephesians is a, a monotheistic, uh, uh, believes in monotheism. There you have it. Um, now, election and predestination are also a, a major feature, I would say, of Ephesians. Uh, when I think of predestination, the texts I think of, first I think of Romans 9, uh, but the second text I think of is Ephesians 1. The question is, of course, as to whether uh, Paul has in mind here individual predestination and election, or perhaps uh, plan predestination and group uh, predestination. As Western individualists, uh, and also as individuals who in these days find it hard not to read predestination language uh, except through the language of Calvin and Augustine, it's easiest for us to see this as being about individuals. God has elected me. God has predestined me. Uh, but of course, the language of election and predestination uh, in Ephesians 1 is corporate and plural. Um, it is, uh, he has predestined the church as it were, to be holy. And he has predestined the church to be adopted. Um, it's collective language uh, rather than individual language, I would argue. Um, and so we have, we have the predestina a, a predestination of the plan, as it were. The plan is predestined. Um, and the, uh, the group is chosen. Um, that may make um, a little difference in how you appropriate Ephesians chapter 1. Um, of course, God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. This speaks to God's power, um, and also I think it speaks to his goodness, uh, because uh, uh, Ephesians isn't talking about uh, mean things uh, or destruct destructive things, uh, but about good things and blessed things and powerful things for the good. Um, so some good stuff here, isn't there, about God. God supplies all our needs, uh, Philippians, bring in a little Philippians here, my God shall supply all your needs. Um, uh, uh, he is able, he empowers. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Of course, that's Christ uh, rather than God the Father. But So a little bit about God in the prison epistles. Um, Christ and salvation in Ephesians. Just as uh, Paul says that there is one God who, uh, and Father, uh, so also Paul says that there is one Lord uh, and one faith and one baptism. Um, and so the one Lord, of course, is Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Anointed One. Um, of course, God raised Jesus from the dead. Again, notice that the consistent language of Paul and Acts is that God the Father raised Jesus uh, from the dead. Uh, not Jesus arose. Um, and that, I think, is probably um, a significant uh, aspect of, of uh, New Testament theology. Jesus was seated at God's right hand far above all other powers. Uh, this is, again, that idea of enthronement as royal king of the cosmos. Um, uh, and uh, Psalm 110.1, uh, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until you make my enemies a footstool. Uh, for my feet, always stands in the background of those sorts of, of passages. And of course, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, uh, the forgiveness of sins. So here we have a little soteriology. Uh, Colossians has a similar uh, verse, although uh, Colossians probably said originally, in Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There's some people who think that there's some sort of conspiracy in Colossians that it doesn't have through his blood, because the King James has through his blood in both places. Uh, but what most scholars would say has happened here is that over time, uh, as Colossians was copied, it, uh, it was drawn toward the language of Ephesians, um, and that originally Colossians didn't have the phrase through his blood at this particular spot, because the oldest manuscripts um, don't have through his blood at that point of Colossians. Um, 
But, of course, Colossians believes it's through his blood. Just because it might not have been there in Colossians originally doesn't mean that uh, Paul and Colossians didn't believe in it. Um, uh, Ephesians and Colossians both have a slightly more what we call realized eschatology than Paul's earlier letters. Um, and so uh, in Romans, uh, he might say, we will be, we will be raised, uh, 2 Corinthians rather, we will be raised. Uh, but in Ephesians and Colossians, we are already raised and seated with Christ in a, in a kind of anticipatory sense. Um, that's one slight shift in the language of Ephesians and Colossians from Paul's earlier uh, letters. And of course, here's the key, uh, the key verse of uh, the Protestant Reformation, very important to John Wesley. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of works. There are a number of shifts again. Um, Ephesians is not typical, is not the, the, the ground zero of Paul's letters. It's not the place to go to get a, uh, although Ephesians is a kind of synopsis in some ways, of Pauline theology, it is a more universalized and generalized version of that, um, it, and it, it it has some shifts that have taken place from pa Paul's earlier uh, letters. So um, I forget who the author was; I, he was at Wheaton for years. Uh, but I would not; uh, I think it's a mistake to use Ephesians as the in inroad to Paul's theology, because Ephesians actually is is rather uh, different from Paul's uh, earlier letters in terms of some of its concepts. For example. Um, the idea of being, of you have been saved. Sal salvation language in Paul's earlier letters is generally future rather than past. Of course, even here, I think uh, this is proleptic. Proleptic means it's so guaranteed that we can speak of it as having had happened, even though it hasn't happened yet. Um, so that, that the sense here might be, by grace, you're going to be saved, but it's so certain that I can say it's already happened. Um, so... Um, normally in Romans, Paul says things like you have been justified in terms of the past tense, justified in terms of the past tense, salvation is a, a future tense. You will be saved from his wrath, uh, Romans 5, 9, uh, for example. Um, also, notice how faith and works have been universalized here, whereas, whereas in Galatians and Romans, it's through the faith of Jesus Christ and not of works of law. Um, so Ephesians has universalized the works to be works in general, uh, whereas in Romans and Galatians it's works of law. And here it is uh, strictly speaking of human faith, I think, in this verse, whereas we've argued that in Romans 3.22 and Galatians 2.14 it was originally the faithfulness of Jesus um, that was in view. So this is, a great, th this is an absolutely true verse. This is a ground zero theology verse essential for uh, the Wesleyan tradition and for the Protestant uh, traditions. However, this is not uh, ground zero of Paul's theology. It represents several minor shifts in the imagery. They fit with the early imagery, don't get me wrong. There's no contradiction uh, between these verses. It just isn't the way Paul uh, puts things in Galatians and Romans. And of course, uh, Jesus' death as a sacrifice is in Ephesians as in Paul's earlier letters. Okay, um, and when we talk about uh, Christology in the prison epistles, the Philippian hymn has to be um, one of the most important uh, places uh, that we go to. Um, I think this is the common English Bible here, um, not uh, any particular reason other than I just was just happened to, um, to put that version up. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus, he did not consider this equality with God something to exploit, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Um, now, I, I do my analysis of the poetry a little different. I see a second stanza beginning here. And having become like human beings, and having been found in shape as a human, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Um, so we have this, the first stanza is often taken in terms of his movement from pre-existence to earthly existence. Form of God as pre-existent to uh, um, emptying himself and taking the form of a slave. And then the second stanza talks about him being in the form of a human being and as a human being humbling himself to the point of death. Uh, some people think that uh, Paul is quoting a pre-existent hymn here and that even death on a cross is an addition uh, to the pre-existent, to the hymn he's using. Therefore, final stanza, 
uh, God highly exalted him, or super exalted him, and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Again, this isn't the way I would um, analyze this hymn. Uh, many think that that to the glory of God the Father at the end is another addition. Um, uh, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth is a possible addition. Uh, I think that maybe even at the name of Jesus is a possible addition to an earlier uh, hymn so that the final stanza would say, Therefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name above all names, that every knee should bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, again, not, not important to life. Um, uh, prison epistles, we talk about those sorts of things. What it, but what is the theology of this hymn? Uh, first of all, the pre-existent Christ had the form of God, which is the equality with God. Um, again, there's plenty of, of paper trail uh, and commentary trail and book trail on what this phrase means, the form of God. The NIV translates it very nature God, which seems to me a, a little bit of a stretch uh, as to what Paul was saying. Uh, but of course, it's true theologically. Uh, some would even debate whether this is talking about the pre-existent Christ, but mo the majority, the vast majority, would say it's talking about the pre-existent uh, Christ. So we start off in the in the hymn uh, with the idea that Jesus existed it, it, with equality with God before he came to earth. Um, Christ modeled a servant's attitude both in him coming from the divine realm to the human realm and in the human realm of being willing to die on a cross and be obedient to death. Um, then Jesus assumed the office of Lord um, as a result of his earthly obedience after his resurrection. He is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Um, Jesus being equated with Lord in Paul's writings and in Acts is, uh, coincides in timing with Jesus' resurrection, exaltation, seating at God's uh, right hand. I should say that um, the name above all names um, most Jews would have uh, would have certainly thought of Yahweh as the name above all names. So there are some who would argue that this uh, hymn, uh, and I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that the hymn that Paul has quoted originally, um, especially, it's a little bit, he clouds it a little if he adds at the name of Jesus here, because then you think, oh, Jesus must be the name above all names. But it's possible, I wonder, if the original hymn was saying that Jesus was given the name Yahweh, um, the name above all names. Jesus is Lord. Lord is the usual Greek translation of Yahweh uh, in the Old Testament. Um, there's a plenty. There's a bit of a paper trail. Uh, see Richard Balcom if you want to see some of the um, uh, the beginning of that discussion. Okay. So then in Colossians we have more Christology. Colossian hymn. I think this is also the Common English Bible. The Son is the image of the invisible God. Uh, the firstborn over all creation. Uh, all things were created by him. And I wonder if this is an expansion of, of Paul of the original hymn, uh, both in heavens and on earth, the things that are visible, the things that are invisible, whether they're thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. And so the second line of this, would going with the first line of verse 16, the parallel line would be, all things were created through him and for him. Uh, 17, he existed before all things, and all things are held together in him. So that's the first kind of stanza uh, of the hymn, which has to do with Christ as the uh, the agent of creation. Christ is the image of God. Uh, Christ is the first. Uh, so the first half has to do with cosmology, as it were. Then the second part of the hymn has to do with ecclesiology. Uh, he is the head of the body, uh, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So you see how you have firstborn over creation in verse 15, and then you have uh, firstborn from the dead in verse 18. Um, that he might occupy the first place in all things. He's over the entire creation. Um, all, the, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him, and he reconciled all things to himself, uh, things on earth or in the heavens. He brought peace through the blood of his cross. So, theology in the, the Colossian hymn, Jesus is the image of God. This is language that was used of Jews of the word of God, the logo, logos, as we would later see in John. So we see uh, perhaps the beginnings of Logos theology here in the Colossian hymn. Um, and I've wondered if, uh, you know, if, the, if there's someone like Apollos, um, kind of the unknown early theologian uh, in the early church that, that stands behind some of this imagery getting into the New Testament tradition and New Testament Christology. Um, so 
Christ is the image of God, which evokes images of the wisdom of God or the word of God in Jewish literature. Um, uh, Jesus is the very meaning of the universe. The whole universe finds its meaning in Jesus. Those are the kinds of thoughts that this language sparks. Um, if you know some of the wisdom of Solomon and the writings of Philo. Firstborn of all creation, um, the suggestion that Jesus is over everything. Uh, of course, the Nicene Creed will say that he is the creator of things invisible and invisible. Um, this hymn is the primary biblical source for that, that imagery. He is the agent of creation. Um, again, is this literal? Is it, is it uh, saying something uh, about uh, Jesus as the, the word or wisdom of God for the universe? Again, debates that have been had in the past. Um, he's above all things that are visible and invisible, so he's over the angels as well. This is, um, um, at some point, an early step in uh, the Christology um, of the New Testament to see Jesus as not over all, all things visible, but over all angelic powers as well. Um, the fullness of God dwells in him. That's an incredibly important uh, theological statement. Also, the head of the church, his body. Remember the... Sh a shift I've mentioned in uh, when I've talked about Corinthians is that Corinthians sees the whole body as the body of Christ. So some of us are ears, some of us are eyes in the body of Christ. Um, but in Colossians and Ephesians, there's been a shift um, from the whole body as being the body of Christ to the whole body being the church and Christ being the head. Uh, so no longer am I the eye, Christ is the eye, he's the head of the church and I am part of the body um, uh, apart from the head. So slight shift again between Colossians and Ephesians and Paul's earlier uh, writings. Jesus reconciles all things. So there's some of the theology uh, in the uh, Christ hymn of Colossians 1. Okay, some more Christology and soteriology in the prison epistles. Uh, Philippians 3, Christ is of surpassing value. Um, 3.9, righteousness comes from God on the basis of faith. This is good old uh, Pauline Lutheran theology that my, in this case, I do believe uh, that Paul is saying that my right standing before God comes on the basis of my faith in Christ. Um, uh, we've talked in uh, earlier uh, places about uh, Romans 3.22 and uh, Galatians 2.14, and in those verses, it seems to me that Paul is talking about... Um, well, uh, in Romans 1, 16, Paul is talking about a righteousness of God. Uh, but the prepositions are pretty clear in Philippians 3, 9, that in this verse, Paul is talking about a right standing God ascribes to me uh, on the basis of my faith. Um, and so the prepositions make it clear that in this verse, that is, in fact, what Paul uh, is talking about. Not God's righteousness or Christ's faith, but my righteousness and my faith. Okay, um, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, salvation is future uh, in Philippians, it seems to me. Uh, again, I already talked about that, that shift of the rhetoric of Ephesians. No contradiction, just a sh shift in the, rhetoric, re in the rhetoric. And so we are to work towards salvation. We are to continue to be faithful uh, and to work out the details as a, as a community of faith as we work toward future salvation from the wrath of God. Um, in Philippians 3, Christ makes resurrection for us possible. And our resurrection body is going to be like Christ's resurrection body. We already said this in 1 Corinthians 15. Here we find it again in Philippians 3. Uh, Colossians talks about how on the, on the cross, our debt, uh, our, our, the record of our debt uh, was nailed uh, to the cross. That's an interesting uh, imagery in Colossians um, that my what I owed to God, as it were, is taken care of on the cross. Uh, and then we died with Christ uh, in Colossians 2, a very Pauline theme from Romans 6, 4, for example. Okay, so uh, that that's uh, theology proper about God the Father and Christology and Soteriology in the prison epistles. Let's move on to the spirit, pneumatology, uh, in the prison epistles. Uh, the Holy Spirit is an earnest of our inheritance, uh, this uh, is we saw this in Second Corinthians one. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit is both a down payment of our future inheritance, oh what a foretaste of glory divine, but also a guarantee. Um, th that's what an earnest is. When you put an earnest money down, you are both guaranteeing uh, 
um, the sale of the house to you and not to anybody else unless the deal falls apart. Deals can fall apart, as you know, if you've ever tried to buy a house, even after you've put down earnest money. So it's not an absolute guarantee, uh, but it is a guarantee uh, that uh, this, this house is mine. And then that, that earnest money is also counted toward the purchase of the house. So the Holy Spirit is a little bit of heaven inside of us um, and also a guarantee of the kingdom of God that is coming. Holy Spirit is a seal of God's ownership, like a stamp or a signet ring seal uh, that says this is God's property. We're God's property if we have the Holy Spirit branded upon us, so to speak. Okay, um, spiritual powers in the prison epistles. So uh, Ephesians 2.2 2 calls Satan the prince of power in the air. And I think the, uh, the imagery here suggests that, as we see elsewhere in the New Testament, um, uh, at this time Jews conceptualized the, the lower sky as being the inhabitant of Satan and his angels. Uh, God dwells in the highest sky. Heaven and sky are the same word in Greek. God dwells in the highest heaven, in the highest sky, uh, but the, in the lowest sky, the air near the earth, that's where Satan and the, and the demons uh, believe. So Satan is the prince of the power of the air, which is why when Jesus says, I have seen Satan fall from the sky like lightning, um, that relates, I think, to this imagery. Uh, he's been dethroned. Um, sin gives the devil opportunity. Uh, again, that idea of the devil is the tempter, Ephesians 4. Uh, I think I put this in the wrong place. Uh, this should be under the ethics slide, but let's go ahead and anticipate the ethics slide. Work, don't steal. Um, let your speech be wholesome. Boy, I got on the wrong slide. Um, that's all ethics. Okay, so those, those two in the middle don't belong on this slide. I don't know how that happened. Work, don't steal. Let your speech be wholesome. Both of those relate to Ephesians um, on, the, on the ethics slides that are to come. Now back to spiritual powers in the prison epistles. We struggle against principalities, power, forces of wickedness, wickedness in uh, the skies. Um, again, uh, we have this idea. This is the armor of God section of Ephesians. A um, um, little bit more than Paul's earlier writings. We do get a hint of this in Romans 8. Um, Nothing shall separate us. From, what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall prince of power, powers? No, they won't. Um, but um, that's not a major theme in Paul's writings, but here we have another instance of it in Ephesians 6, that we are struggling against spiritual uh, persons, uh, forces. Um, Christ defeated, however, these powers, Colossians 2. Um, fitting, this fits with Colossians' theme that Christ is over all spiritual powers. That's one of the major themes of Colossians. Okay, spiritual powers in the prison epistles with a couple ethics slipped in. The church in Ephesians. So Ephesians, uh, again, when you think of Ephesians, the unity of the church is uh, definitely, Ephesians has a grand ecclesio uh, ecclesiological content. Um, you are one body and one spirit, just as also called you in one hope, uh, that oneness passage in Ephesians 4, one God and one Lord, one faith. Uh, Christ is the head of the body. We already talked about how this is a shift uh, from earlier where Christ is uh, the whole body, um, but Ephesians and Colossians shift to Christ being the head of the body. Uh, Christ is the cornerstone of the temple of the people of God. This is again another, another shift. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, no one can lay any foundation except the one that is laid, Jesus Christ. Um, in uh, Ephesians, the foundation is uh, the apostles and prophets with Christ as the cornerstone. So slight Again, no contradiction, uh, but a slight shifting of the metaphor from Jesus being the foundation of the church to the foundation of the church being the apostles and Christian prophets with Jesus as the cornerstone. Uh, interesting. Um, another shift. In Ephesians, Christ has abolished the law, uh, which was the wall if in Ephesians imagery. imagery the, wall is the, the law is the wall that separated Jew and Gentile, and Jesus has abolished the law, abolished the wall, and now there is no difference between uh, Jew and Gentile um, in the church. Now, how's this a shift? Because Paul says in Romans 3, 31, do we therefore uh, negate the law? No, we establish law. And also, uh, Jesus uses the same word in uh, Matthew 5, 17. Uh, I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And so Matthew doesn't take a 
Uh, again, there's no contradiction, uh, but it is a different it is a different way of looking at the law. Matthew says Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. Ephesians says Christ has abolished the law. So again, um, sometimes uh, uh, people use different words that on a superficial level contradict each other, but when you dig down to the substance of what they're saying, it doesn't contradict. So in Matthew, uh, Jesus fulfilling the law means that he's shuffling the law uh, in the light of uh, the law of love. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 9 uh, that he's not under the law, but he's under Christ's law, which is, of course, the law of love. Um, So this is a shift in the language, to be sure. Um, But I think ultimately they they agreed on the substance. Uh, We all have differing roles to play in the church. Uh, Again, Ephesians 4 is one of those key spiritual gift passages. You have Romans 12 and uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4. These are the key passages on uh, the different kinds of roles that people played in the early church. Most of those roles are still in play today. Maybe not all of them, and there may be some new ones, uh, but uh, it's not an absolute list. It's not a systematic theology. Um, But uh, we do find in Ephesians 4 uh, some of the key roles of the early church. Now, one one debate point is in the, the interpretation of Ephesians 4.12. Is Paul saying that the, the, the job of apostles and prophets is to equip saints to do the work of the ministry? If that's the right interpretation, and that I think is the majority interpretation right now, um, but, but if that's what Paul's saying, then the purpose of leaders in the church is to equip lay people to do the work of the ministry. The King James had a comma there, though, which is also possible that the role of apostles and prophets is to equip the saints, comma, to do the work of the ministry. Um, to, if the comma is the right interpretation, then Paul was saying that apostles and prophets do the work of the ministry. And part of that work of the ministry is to equip the saints. Um, again, a uh, major difference in what, how you see the role of church leaders, uh, because if you take the, the King James interpretation, then... Uh, church leaders do the work of the ministry. But if you take the uh, kind of current popular interpretation, uh, then the goal of leaders is to equip lay people to do the work of the ministry. Interesting. Uh, okay, uh, and of course, Ephesians 5 uses the uh, the parallel of the husband-wife relationship of that day. And I, I do emphasize that, that there is nothing specifically Christian about the hierarchy that Paul assumes in Colossians and Ephesians. That household structure is Aristotelian. Um, what is uniquely Christian is the way Paul sanctifies the cultural structure of that day. And one of the ways he sanctifies it in Ephesians 5 um, is to suggest that a husband should love their wives as Christ loves the church uh, and so forth and gave himself for her. Um, Okay, more about the ecclesiology. Uh, We are all citizens of heaven. So Philippians 3, uh, Philippi was a Roman colony. And so to say that our actual citizenship uh, is in heaven pushed back against um, anybody who might have found their identity in their Romanness. Um, And we might say the same thing today, um, that for anybody who might be a little bit too uh, American first and Christian second, um, that we are citizens of heaven before we are citizens of the United States. Um, uh, And Paul makes that point to the Philippians, um, uh, who are in a Roman colony. They are citizens of heaven um, in their primary identity rather than citizens of Rome in their primary identity. Um, Colossians 2 has some imagery that reminds me again of Romans 6. We are buried with Christ in baptism uh, and we are also raised up with him uh, through faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Again, that kind of sense of mystical participation in the death and resurrection of Jesus. What about Israel? Uh, Again, Ephesians 2 talks about how the wall has been torn down. This is, again, slightly more... um, There's there's a little... It it feels different here uh, than it does in Romans 11. In Romans 11, Israel is still the trunk of the tree, and the natural branches of Israel have been uh, cut out, and the, uh, the Gentiles have been grafted in, but the tree remains... The tree remains an Israel tree in Romans 11. Um, It's just that the the Gentiles have been grafted in. That's not at all the feel of Ephesians 2. In Ephesians Ephesians 2, it feels like 
Jew and Gentile are now on a completely uh, equal status. In, in fact, it feels like, Romans 11 feels like we're coming from a Jewish Gentile to the incorporation of the Gentiles. Uh, Ephesians 2 gives the feel of, of Gentiles uh, being, um, you know, the wall being completely torn down to have a unified people of, of God. It just feels different in Ephesians 2 uh, in relation to Israel than it feels in, in Romans 11. Um, Colossians 2 calls the Jewish law a shadow of Christ. And of course, here he's talking about Sabbath observance, uh, new moons, festivals, food laws, that sort of thing. Um, Colossians is, of course, one of the key passages to suggest that Christians are not, uh, that is, Gentile Christians, are not obligated to keep the Jewish Sabbath. Romans 14 gives the same uh, sense of, of things, uh, that, that it's a matter of conviction uh, in Romans 14. Okay, Revelation in the prison epistles. Um, both Ephesians and Colossians give us the sense that this unification of Jew and Gentile in Christ is unexpected. It's a mystery. Who knew? Who knew that God was going to bring the Gentiles in? Um, it, that's, there's a, that sense that, that even though we now read the Old Testament, it seems obvious to us that everybody, everybody with a brain should have known that you know, Jesus was going to do this. Um, it's pretty clear from Ephesians that, that uh, it came as a surprise to Paul and, and others as well. It's an unexpected mystery. Uh, that Christ would be in the Gentiles, the same as in Jews. Uh, of course, there's special revelation to prophets and Christian prophets, um, this idea that God uh, has given them in, in inspiration and revelations that go uh, beyond the Old Testament, as it were. Um, so, revelation. Ethics in the prison epistles. So, uh, I'll start with the two I've already had about not speaking unwholesomely, um, and also, what was the other one, not stealing but working. Um, ethics in the prison epistles continued. So there's a strong emphasis on the unity of the church uh, in Ephesians. We've already talked a little bit about this. All of Paul's letters, it seems, emphasize the unity of the church. Unity is a big deal for Paul. I don't, I don't think I've always seen that, uh, but it's very clear. Every one of his letters, it seems, at some point gets around to unity. Maybe not Philemon, although even there, the unity between a slave owner and his slave is, is, is pretty clear. Be truthful. So if you want to know where are the best passages to talk about truthfulness, Ephesians and Colossians. Uh, uh, not taking the, na or, uh, um, the ninth commandment, do not bear false witness, was originally about law court testimony, I think. You know, when you're, when you're being brought uh, to give witness to uh, whether someone else has committed a, a wrongdoing or not, you know, do not bear false witness. Um, it, uh, but the, so you, you see that's really about a, a, a very... A, a, a certain kind of setting. Uh, the, the statements on truthfulness in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 are much more, more general. Um, do not sin in your anger. So it's possible to be angry and not to sin is the implication here. Be kind. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Again, basic Christian principle there. Um, habitual sinners won't be in the kingdom. This reminds me of 1 Corinthians 6, uh, where Paul says something like, make no mistake, such people won't be in the kingdom of God. And the same thing here in, in Ephesians 5. Um, so uh, it doesn't matter whether you've been gotten wet in baptism. If, if you are uh, a person who is constantly doing this and unrepentant, you're not going to be in the kingdom of God, Paul says. Um, and then, as I've already mentioned, Paul redeems Aristotle's household structure. So uh, Aristotle basically says you have the husband over the wife and the wife and husband over the children, and then over the slaves. So those categories of, hus of husband, wife, master, slave, parent, child, those are Ar Aristotelian categories from the 300s BC. Um, uh, Paul uh, takes this structure, this, this pagan structure, it's not a Christian structure, he takes this cultural structure and he sanctifies it, he redeems it, he works within it. Um, to say, what does a Christian look like within this cultural uh, framework? Um, uh, we also have stuff on the significance and helpfulness and importance of prayer uh, in Ephesians chapter 6. More ethics, a lot of ethics in Ephesians and Colossians in that third section. In fact, uh, you, can do, you, can, you can put Ephesians and Colossians next to each other, and you'll find that basically, in my opinion, Ephesians uh, used the Colossians as a starting point. Uh, because Ephesians gives a more generalized version of the more specific uh, Colossians. 
Um, the importance of unity is in uh, Philippians. We've already talked about, about that. Uh, love one another. Again, a, a very important New Testament theme, central theme. The importance of being blameless. Again, you will not find in Paul's writing, uh, if you read the passages in context, you just won't find in Paul's writings this idea that we're all miserable failures. Romans 7 is not about that. That's not what Romans 7 is saying. In fact, it's the opposite of what Romans 6 through 8 are trying to say. The importance of being morally blameless uh, before God is a key theme of Paul's writings. And here we find it in Philippians uh, 1.10 and in Colossians 1.22. We must live worthy lives. Um, uh, perhaps the key verse uh, of Philippians in 1.27. Rejoice, um, even in suffering, another key theme of uh, Philippians. Be at peace, uh, Philippians 4.7 and Colossians 3.15. There are treasures of wisdom to be found in Christ, uh, a, a special theme of Colossians and Colossians 1.3. Uh, slaves are our brothers. There, let me slip in a little Philemon there at the end. Uh, that, that even though uh, even though Paul does not argue for uh, social change in terms of structures of society, Paul doesn't argue for the structures of society. In 1 Corinthians 9, he more or less says, you know, Christ is coming back soon operate in whatever whatever situation you find yourself in because the time is is short um, but within that framework in Philemon Paul suggests uh, that um, the slave owner Philemon should look at at Philemon himself as a brother um, um, rather than as a slave uh, I'm not sure that Phi I, I really don't think Philemon tells Philemon to set Onesimus free we read it that way because it's hard for us not to read it that way uh, Paul doesn't really command him um, to do that, uh, but Paul does tell uh, Philemon to receive Onesimus as as a brother. Um, finally, we get to the finalies, and that is eschatology, the theology of last things in the prison epistles. So, uh, for now, God will complete the work he begins in us. Uh, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So God will work with us um, to bring us to uh, we don't have, you know, God will help us get to the kingdom of God. Um, he'll work with us. Um, when, if we die before he comes back, we go to be with Christ. So Philippians 1.23 uh, is one of the key verses on the intermediate state. 2 Corinthians 5 would be the other key Pauline passage on us being conscious between death and resurrection. We get mis mixed signals from Paul's writings uh, because in 1 Thessalonians 4.5, and in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, it sounds like Paul is saying that we sleep, uh, but Paul doesn't use that imagery of sleep after 1 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 5 and in Philippians 1, Paul doesn't use that imagery anymore, uh, but he gives us the impression that we die and immediately are present with Christ and conscious of it. Um, this may involve a shift in Paul's understanding. Paul in his earlier writings may think that he's going to be alive when Christ returns. But by the time he writes Philippians, uh, he seems to have come to... Uh, believe that he will die before Christ uh, returns. Maybe. Uh, okay, we have an inheritance through Christ. I use X just because I wanted to keep it on one line, but I'm not being a heretic. Uh, Christ, think of it not as an X, but think of it as a key. Uh, it is the first letter of Christ's name, key. So that's a Greek key, not an X as in unknown, okay? In fact, that's what Xmas originally meant, Christmas. It's the keymus. It's the, the first letter in Greek of Christ's uh, name. So again, I'm not being a heretic here. I'm just trying to save space on a PowerPoint, and I'm using the Greek key. Okay, I could have actually done a Greek key, I suppose. Um, we used to be children of wrath, but we're not anymore. This suggests that if we're not uh, in Christ, then we are children of wrath, and uh, uh, bad times